Okay, well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We have another, uh, another fun day. I hope you have lots of questions. So, do we have somebody with the mics? Yeah. Uh, we have one person with a mic. Don't worry, I've got, I'm handling it. You're handling it? Okay. <laughs> Go Tom, right ahead. Questions about, um, I guess, around new, new souls. So when a new soul IUOC is um, partitioned off, would this be the first environment they ever have any experience in? Or are there environments before this PMR that to, would acclimate them to being an IUOC? OK. Um, there's two levels to that, to the answer to your question, and that is that there's two things here. There's an IUOC, Individuated Unit of Consciousness, and there is a Free Will Awareness Unit. Okay? It's this Free Will Awareness Unit that is a, just a partitioned off piece of the Individuated Unit of Consciousness. And it's this Free Will Awareness Unit that actually is logged on to the avatar. Okay? Now, the Individuated Unit of Consciousness has uh, access to and memory of all the past incarnations that it's ever had. So it's the cumulative function. It has it all. But when it, when it partitions off this free will awareness unit, that free will awareness unit has none of that information. So if we're talking about the free will awareness unit that's logging on, it comes with no information or memory at all of that. If we're talking about the, its parent, the IUC, yes, it's got all the information about that, that being. And has, has that IUOC um, had avatars and other environments prior to playing this free will awareness unit? Yeah, if it had been, if that IUOC had been playing free will awareness units in other reality systems, it would have all that information as well. Yes, it would be aware of all of that. So to answer your question, every free will awareness unit that is logged on to an avatar has no previous information. But all of the IUOCs have all their previous information. But what about the IUOC that's just been newly mined, newly created? Okay, because as population increases, then more IUOCs are needed to log on to the available seats, right? So how does that come about? The system takes an, an average, a typical uh, IUOC, and that's what is created to start a new IUOC. So a new IUOC, IUOC doesn't start at the bottom. It's like you know, very, very low entropy and has to work its way up from zero uh, or from very high entropy, has to work its way to a lower entropy. It starts at about a, an average condition. Otherwise, just having new players would start to pull down the, the uh, overall entropy of the system. So it starts in the middle with an average, so it doesn't really affect the entropy of the system at all. But it would not come with any history. It wouldn't come with any memory. It wouldn't come with any base of experience. So that brand new IUOC, when it creates a free will awareness unit and logs it on, that would be its first and only experience. Because that would be its, its first uh, time that it's logged on to an avatar to play the game. So where does it fit in? with the concept that this environment, or is there any, any validity to the idea that this environment, this physical, this PMR, is a um, part of a progression of evolution, that you get here only after, like, you, you've often said that this is a great schoolhouse. There are some better, some worse. Why would this schoolhouse get picked versus a less uh, PMR-type environment to start well. in? First of all, there's not a sequence that you move through different uh, PMRs. Generally, you, you, you would be working in a PMR 
because that's where you had your maximum probability of lowering your entropy, of succeeding, of evolving. So that's the only reason to pick one PMR from another is whether or not it improves your potential for making good choices. That's why most IUOCs are going to continue to pick the same PMR over and over again because once you get used to that, you know the ropes there and how it works and the nature of it, then it's a little easier to get started the next time. You already come with relevant experience, but you can go to others. But it's not like there's a stepping stone. First you do A and then you do B and you graduate from B, you do C. It's not like that. You just go to wherever it is that's good for you. Okay, so it's not a, it's not a sequence. Uh, you say that a free will awareness unit comes with no memory, but that's not entirely true, is it? It's not always true. There's always exceptions, but it's, it's mostly true. The memory that you have of maybe a past life or whatever is memory that you get out of the database. It's not necessarily what you, what, that you come with that memory. It's, it's, it's available to you. Let's put it that way. It's available to you. You can get into the databases and you can explore past lives and future possibilities. And if you are very intuitive, like many children are, then that's pretty accessible to you. But you don't actually start with experience. Don't you start with, well, don't at least some people start with proclivities or yes. temptations or whatever they might be? Yes, often people start with that. But that is because those proclivities are part of what they bring from, the, from their parent IUOC. That consciousness, as it's evolved, has certain attitudes, fears, proclivities, that sort of thing. And when you get a petition off a part of that, that's just part of that, that being level of the IUOC. So yes, you get those sorts of things, but it doesn't come necessarily with a memory of a past experience. But it does come with attitudes even. Uh, proclivities, talents, interests. There's a lot of that that comes. They're not really so specific as they are general, but just they, they do tend to, you know, if you look at, you know, infants or one-year-olds, two-year-olds, three-year-olds, and you watch them grow up, you'll notice that characteristics that you could see when they were one and two and three years old are the same characteristics they're walking around with now that they're 30 and 40. There's a lot of sameness in that you can see, you know, the child that was, you know, that was bubbly in this, you know, it's an adult that's bubbly and there's a, there's a lot of similarities, basic characteristics that we take with us and we start with that. That's what I mean when you hear me say that everybody's doing about the best they can with what they came in, you know, with what they've got. Well, with what they've got means with what they've come in with. You come in with a, with a lot. You don't come in just blank. You come in with a lot, but it's not specific experience that you come in with. That's the difference, is what I mean. Morning, Tom. Good morning, Donna. I'm gonna do my best here. Uh, I'm a free will awareness unit right now, and I wanna go out of mind, and I'm going to get information into my consciousness and go to another dimension. Those dimensions, will they be the same dimensions I'll be able to see when I go back to my full self, my IUOC? And are those the same dimensions you're seeing or experiences that you're having? Do, you, do I need to say it differently? Um, I think you're saying that when you have experiences, are you going to a place that, that uh, is fundamentally exists so that if I go there too, I'll see the same things and have similar experiences? Is that right? Or 
so it's non-physical matter reality, mm -hmm. and I'm going to go somewhere. I can communicate with other um, entities in those dimensions. Those yes. Are they the? Are, are there so many that will never see the same ones, or the the larger consciousness system is giving us what we need, so it'll be you know something for me and not necessarily something for you. Yes, it'll be something for you, not necessarily for me. What you'll see and what you'll experience there is probably going to be unique to yourself. Now, there will be some similarities with other people, but that's mostly not because you and the other people have gone to the same place, but it's that you, the, you and the other people come from the same culture, and you interpret data, and you have similar uh, patterns in your growth, then you'll report things that are very similar. But my, the best model I can think of for an out-of-body experience where you go out and meet people and see things is that it's a, a single-player virtual reality game. So it's, it's yours. Now other people may see things that are, that are uh, similar because they may have similar lessons to learn and similar things that they need to do. And the system may get a little lazy sometimes and just has some, some things that it, you know, that it does over again, makes the same game for this person as it made for that person, because that's just easy for it to do that. But basically, everything that you experience is because you're getting a data stream. And that data stream comes to you individually from the system. And that data stream has things in it that will help you grow. So it's individual more than it is shared. Yeah. But it can be shared. You identify. Yes, it can be shared. That tends to be the exception rather than the, the rule. It can be shared. Um, you can make up, you know, instead of just a single player game, you can make up a uh, a multiplayer game, um, like Dennis and I did, or you can make up a game where there's, uh, well, here, here's another sort of game. You've heard the, the uh, games that are about soul retrieval. Maybe you know about that. That's a, that's a reality, that's a virtual reality game where you go into an altered state and then you help other people who are having trouble transitioning from this life to being dead, you know, and that's called a transition reality. And for some reason, they're having difficulty making the transition. They've died, maybe under traumatic conditions of some sort, and they're having a little difficulty getting reoriented, and then you go help them, all right? That's just another virtual reality game. Most of the entities you run into there are NPCs just like they are in your out of body. Most of the, the uh, entities you run into and interact with are NPCs. They're characters played by the computer just for you, just to give you an opportunity to make a good choice. And of course, if it gives you an opportunity to make a good choice, it has to give you an opportunity to make a bad choice as well. So in those games, sometimes those players, there may be you know, if you go to a course uh, where this is being taught and you and maybe 30 people are all in this soul retrieval, help the people trans, you know, transfer from being in this reality to another reality. And sometimes those people meet and work as teams or work with each other. So you see now it's a multiplayer game with those people cooperating. And those people can actually come back and remember all the things that they did together, and they both remember it, so it's, they were doing that together. The system will support that sort of thing. But still, most of the, the interaction that they're having are with NPCs, not with other players like themselves. So the system will really support whatever sort of game you need to help you grow up. That's sort of the way that works. And when I make that, um, 
Mm -hmm. You know, when I use that soul retrieval thing as, a, as an example, I always have to say that don't think that because it's a virtual reality that the system's giving you and because the souls you're saving are mostly NPCs that are there for, your, you, know, for you to work with, that doesn't make it not real. That doesn't make it just a game. It's as real as anything else. This reality is information. That reality is information. There's absolutely no reason to think that this reality is somehow more real than reality that you play in in your dreams or the reality that you do when you're doing soul retrieval. See, It's just a different game. Just as real, just as important, just as fundamental, and you evolve or de-evolve just as much by the choices you make in, the, in any of those realities. So this idea that, oh, you know, when I did that, I thought it was real. And now you're telling me I was just working with NPCs. It is real. It doesn't get any more real than that. Whether you work with NPCs or work with, with other players is really irrelevant makes no difference. The other player is a free will awareness unit, okay, which is a piece of an individual unit of consciousness, which is a piece of the system. When it's an NPC, it's just a piece of the system. What's the difference? It's a piece of the system either way. So that NPC is not a fake character. It's no more fake than, than you are here, a fake character. Yeah, it's real. The choices you make are real. The growth opportunities are real. So don't think that uh, playing a virtual reality game with NPCs is somehow a lesser sort of thing to do than interacting with people in this reality. It isn't. It's just as fundamental, it's just as real, and it's just as significant. The advantage of it is that you get to make choices that you wouldn't be able to make here. You're not going to experience those kinds of choices here. It's the same with your dream reality. That's why we work in a dream reality every night, because that gives us another whole set of choices that we don't have in this reality. Another whole set of you know, opportunities to make good choices. So. Information is real, and it really isn't anything that's more real than that. So I've heard it said before that your relationship with yourself is the one that's most important, and that all other relationships are a reflection of that. And so I'm really interested in then uncovering who I am, like my true self. And so yesterday, you talked about the instincts. And you said that in the beginning, our instincts, they just kind of are who we are. We identify with that cultural overlay. But then as we grow up, you said we start to distinguish between you, me, and the cultural overlay. And so I'm looking at, OK, so if I'm not my instincts, then who am I? Well, I'm an IUOC. But who is that IUOC? Is that, is that is that like love? Is that, is that unconditional love? Because I also hear, you know, you say, you don't have to go get anything, you just have to get rid of your fear. So when you get rid of your fear, what's left is love. So is that who I really am, is love? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> you are really, really talented at confusing yourself. <laughs> It makes sense to me, though. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> who, you, who you are, really, is just the result of all the choices that you have ever made in all your incarnations. Right. Okay? You've made all these choices. You've made these decisions. And that's who you are. It's the sum of all of that. Right. Okay? And as you make future choices, who you are will change. Mm -hmm. okay, so you get to choose who you are in that, in that sense. Okay. 
it is important for you to focus on your own fears, particularly first, because it's really hard for you to be real good for other people if you're just full of fears yourself. So that's true. You do need to focus on yourself and get that worked out. And that should be like a first priority. But as you do that, and as you gain some, some uh, confidence in who you are, then it ought to more and more become about other people, not about you. I mean, it's still always about you in some part because you're still growing up, you're making choices. It's about your choices and seeing how those choices played out. And do those choices in the long term make you happy or make you sad? And then you learn from them. Right. You've got that going on all the time. Because but, that making it about other and giving, that's what I did. And I like lost myself and it was not a good thing. <laughs> like just giving and giving to another person almost killed me. Yeah, but <laughs> you see, it's not the action that is that important. It's why mm. you take that action. Right. It's the intent behind it right. is what's really important. And so I was giving to him because I wanted him to love me. So that you was were, about me. You were trying, yes. Yeah. It was because of your own needs, mm. your own drives. It was because of your own fear right, right, that right. you made the choice, you see. <laughs> so it was really driven by my ego, by your my ego, fear. by your needs, by your fears. Mm. And that's why it doesn't work out because when you do things that are driven by your fears, they almost always don't work out very well. That's just the way it works. It's doing things for the wrong reasons and you often get poor results. Okay, so then I hear, rather than going outside for external validation, I need to fill my own needs. I need to be happy myself, right? But then my instincts are telling me Go be with a man. Those are my instincts. And then you said, when you don't trust your instincts and you're crosswired and you're all screwed up. So like. <laughs> yeah. all, these, all these things have to grow up together. It's not like you are a whole bunch of individual pieces and each piece has to, has to uh, grow up individually. All of these things have to evolve and grow up together. You do have to work on yourself and understand those fears in order to get rid of them. But you still have to interact with other people because it's your interaction with other people that lets you see how you're doing. You know, where am I? How am I doing? Go interact with people. See, don't be afraid to connect. Don't be afraid to give. Don't be afraid to love. Don't be afraid to reach out and embrace things. That's good. But be wary of why, what are your motivations, and keep an eye on how's it working. Okay. Now, to keep an eye on how's it working, that eye needs to be unbiased and unprejudiced. Because if you have this fear and you really want it to work really, really badly because you have this need for it to work, then when you say, how is it working, you're likely to trick yourself and say, oh, it's great. Okay, you know, he beat me up yesterday, but that's because, yeah. you Make know, excuses, the, he got right. bitten by a dog, you know, <laughs> something happened. Yeah. And I understand that, yeah, I can, yeah, it wasn't, wasn't nice, I didn't enjoy it, but I, I understand. See, so you start making excuses because you still have that need and those excuses are coming out of the need. So you just, have to grow up together, but you do have to reach out. And you do have to connect. And don't be afraid to, to do that, but keep track of why you're doing that. Mm -hmm. And is it working? And when it's not working, then you stop doing that. Right. If it does work, then invest a little more in it and say, well, okay, I'll make a little more investment in there. Now, how's that working? If that's working okay, make a little more investment. Don't just take everything you got in the bank, throw it in a you know, <laughs> pile and say, yeah, I know this is going to work. Yeah. That something like that is driven by fear, mm -hmm. by need, by ego. <clears throat> so you just have to be aware of yourself, kind of know how you operate, yeah. and then be wary that, you know, why are you doing what you're doing? Mm -hmm. go, in, go slowly. Mm -hmm. 
as you go, assess and, and see how it's working. What's the feedback? You see? So that's it. Mm -hmm. And hopefully I listened this time. Because you told me this. You told me this at the beginning of my relationship. I'm like, I met a guy. You're like, take it slow, Vanessa. Take it slow. <laughs> I'm like, too late. We're engaged. <laughs> so, yeah. Yes. I think I'll listen this time. Yeah. <laughs> Vanessa, I've told you this at least four or five times. <laughs> yeah, yeah. More than that. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, it's a process. Yeah. And, you know, you have to be lighthearted with it. It's a process, yeah. and the process needs to be fun. And you need to allow yourself to make mistakes and do things wrong. That's okay. Making mistakes is how we learn. Yeah. That's not a process. You know, you shouldn't say, oh, I made a mistake. Something's wrong with me. You know, yeah. I'm just not, I'm not smart enough or I'm not worthy enough or something's just wrong with me. That isn't true. Yeah. You I was just, brave enough to try. I'm yeah. courageous because I'm going out yeah, there. I'm just living be life. Courageous. Go try. Yeah. But don't try blindly. Try to right. be aware of what you're doing and why you're doing it and assess it as you go before you make more and more investments. Mm -hmm. And that is much better because whenever you go after something, when it's your need that's chasing an ideal, this is what I want, this is what I need, and I'm going to chase after it. I want it. I'm pursuing it. As long as you pursue it, it will elude you. Mm. It okay. has to just let it happen mm -hmm. and let it happen naturally. Mm -hmm. it's yeah. the, when you're in pursuit, that's a need and an ego. Yeah. If you just let life come to you as it comes and interact with it as you do and assess whether it's good or not good, then everything will just work out really well. Okay. Thanks, Tom. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, it's all right. I'll tell you again if you need it, you know, a couple of months from now. But I am growing up. Look, I'm not crying. Yeah, <laughs> I see that. Right? Yeah. I'm yeah. holding you back a little bit. <laughs> Good. Who has the mic? Uh, so several years ago, I went to a couple different intuitives, um, basically asking, what am I here to do? And both times I got the answer that it wasn't to do something, that being who I am here is what's going to be helpful, which is really in concordance what you I've seen you tell people in the forums when they keep you say they keep asking for something to do, and you tell them you need to be a different way. Um, and then yesterday you were saying that something like being kinder can be jump-started with the intellect, but this is a process where what is what is the path to feeling like that is enough to to be rather than to be doing something what do you mean by that is enough the to to address and be rid of the feeling that i have to be actively doing something um as a life purpose or what have you rather than being who i am and going through life with that. So when do you know when you have the right balance between doing and being and focusing on what it is you, you need to, what you feel like you need to do and where you need to go and just being? Yes. It has to be a, obviously a mix of both. And you have to have balance. Just like you need balance between the intuitive side and the intellectual side. You can't say that either one of those is, is the best thing and the other one is not. You need both of those working together. You need to just be, accept things as they come and interact with what comes to you, yes. But at the same t time, you need to engage and connect with people and be a part of things. If you kind of remove yourself and you know, go sit in a cave someplace and say, well, I'm just going to wait here for something to happen. You know, that's not, that's an extreme and that's not good either. So engaging with people is important because that's where most of our learning is going to come from. That's where our challenges come from. It's other people who can really press your buttons and get your ego to stand up and scream, you know. 
Nothing else can do it like other people. So, and those people that are closest to you are the ones that can do it the most. So you need to engage with people and try to see these people as doing the best they can with what they've got. Don't engage with them judgmentally. Just engage and interact and stay positive. So that's the doing part. You got to go out there and do. But also, at the same time, you need to be aware of what you're doing, how you're doing it, why you're doing it. You know, that's the inside part. So if you interact with people, let's say there's people, family members you have, and those family members are people that you tend to disagree with, or they, you know, you get in arguments with them, or they try to boss you around, or you, whatever, they just, you have problems there. Well, then make it a point to interact with those family members, but stay positive, see? So that would be a thing to go do. I'm going to go talk to you know, my Uncle Fred, who usually tries to tell me how to live my life and that I'm not doing things right and so on. And we end up, you know, I end up getting angry. And, but I'm going to go talk to him, and I'm not going to get angry. I'm not going to get upset. I'm just going to think, Uncle Fred's just who he is. That's just how he sees things. It's not about me. It's about him. And if he's grouchy, well, see, that's too bad. Have a little compassion for him if he's grouchy and irritating. If he's like that, it's because he's not happy. He's miserable. He's not doing well. Maybe you could think of something that would put a smile on his face, even though what he's doing is trying to tell you how to live your life and that you're living it the wrong way. Just smile at that and let it go and change the subject to say something nice to him. See how that works, you see? So go to those places where your engagement holds a really good lesson for you. Engage with it, and engage with it positively. Let the people be just how they are. Don't get into this, you know, I wish Uncle Fred wasn't that way. When he's that way, that really annoys me. That's your ego. I don't like Uncle Fred being the way Uncle Fred is, and I need him to change, otherwise I'm going to be upset. So I don't want to go around him because he doesn't, he doesn't act the way I want him to act. Well, he's going to act the way he is. And you just have to accept that that's the way he is. You see? And learning that, if you avoid Uncle Fred all the time, then you miss the lesson. The lesson's there, but you miss it. So those things in your life that are challenging are the exact things that you need to go embrace. And embrace them being positive, always positive. Even if that other person is negative. You have to stay positive. Now sometimes that's really hard to do. Well, do it the best you can. Maybe you can only spend three minutes with Uncle Fred before you need to go someplace else, you know. But it's okay, you know, work at it a little bit. And you'll be surprised how other people will change as you stop struggling, your, your ego stop struggling with their ego. You'll be surprised how they'll change. You, know, you will, if you are nice to Uncle Fred, and you say something positive to him, and you do that occasionally, even if it's only for a couple of minutes, pretty soon, you'll find out that Uncle Fred is still terrorizing everybody else, but you, he, died. he stopped. He doesn't do that with you anymore. He treats you differently, you see? And you'll realize that Uncle Fred is the way he is just because of the interaction, because it's ego, struggling with ego, struggling with ego, and when you stop struggling with his ego, oh, he can now be himself, because he's being driven by his fears. And now you don't trigger his fears anymore. So you become his favorite niece. And he actually can come and talk to you and not tell you what you should be doing and not fuss with you. So you've just helped Uncle Fred grow up a lot 
because now he has an outlet of somebody that he really cares for. Before, he was just fighting with everybody. You see? So that's how I mean. As you grow up, you help everybody else grow up. And as they grow up, they help everybody else grow up. It's not like that you are just a, an alone individual. And if you grow up, well, who, who will care? Who will notice? Everybody will care and notice. You will affect people. So that's the, kind of your balance, the going doing and being. You have to go do to interact and to connect with people. But then you have to be a quality enough person that you can interact with caring and with positiveness rather than getting upset. As soon as you feel yourself being annoyed or upset, then you just have had your ego snagged. And now you are making poor choices. So you back up. Yeah, back up from that and say, whoops, take a breath. Let's start over. I don't want to go there. It's not about me. It's about him. Why is he like that? You know, and try to explore that a little bit. Ask him how he's doing, how he feels. And he may be grouchy and fuss and, you know, do all that kind of stuff. And you can just listen. And then maybe you can say uh, something like, well, I hope you, you know, hope things work out for you. Give him a hug and then walk off. That'll surprise him so much because he knows that everybody hates him. And because he knows that, that's why he's so hateful. Because he knows everybody hates him. When he knows that you don't, you just gave him a hug on purpose. That may change his whole you know, outlook on life. So unexpected. So, yeah, that's, that's what you do. Embrace the stuff that challenges you and work with it. And that will help you grow up faster. If you just sit in the cave and wait for things to happen, you won't grow much because that doesn't challenge you. It's easy to sit in a cave by yourself and be positive. Yeah, that's not too hard. If you like yourself, it's, it's easy. Yeah. But to go out there and interact with the people on the street and with your family members and the people at work and your boss and all those people and stay positive, now that's a challenge. But it's a challenge that you can grow from. And some people, if, you, if they just don't seem to ever you know, snap out of it, well, you can still be nice to them on occasion, but maybe you don't see them all that often. But when you do, you're positive. And you, you know, look, wait for change. If it never comes, that's OK, too. It's their life, their responsibility. You're not in charge of helping people. Don't go out with the idea, oh, I'm going to help Uncle Fred. I, you know, I'm going to fix him. That's the wrong attitude. You're just going to be yourself, and you're going to be positive, and then you're going to let that do whatever it does. Because that's also an ego that says, I'm going to go out and fix people, because I know better than they do. So even if you're not fixing them by telling them how to live their life, but you're fixing them you know, by smiling at them, it's still a manipulation, and it's coming from the intellect. And that won't be helpful. That will backfire. Because Uncle Fred will know that you're just trying to manipulate him into a, you know, a different response. And he will resent it. And it will make everything worse. It has to really be honest. Uh, yes, hi, Tom. Um, I, I have a hard time. Uh, telling apart if it's ego or intuition. Because we had a situ situation in New York, New York City where we're on the subway, and then this guy comes along and he asks for money. And well, this guy, he looked fine. I mean, he looked, I think, I think better than me. I mean, he, was, he had his comb, hair combed and, <laughs> I mean, well dressed. I mean, his clothes was nice and everything. And he's just asking for money. And I say, wow. And then all the people there, they, they didn't look at him. They were like, oh, my God, I mean, how can you dare ask for money? And the thing is that Carmen's instinct w was to give him whatever, you know, $1, $5, whatever. And in my case, it, it was like, no, I mean, my instinct, my intuition tells me 
that this guy is a con man. He's he's just trying to pull over one. I mean, over us. And so so it was my intuition, but I know it was also my judgment. Because I, I I mean I, I scanned him. So how can you tell apart? I mean I know that probably she was right as always. <laughs> that's that's a given. Right? Yes, that's a given. <laughs> But in my case, I, I need to um, work on that, and and I I, can, I don't like to be fooled, no. So mm -hmm. I say this guy, I mean, he's everything. It, look, he looks really fine, and and then this other guy, he interacted, and he said he told him, okay, I'm gonna help you, but don't use it on drugs. So he was like conditioning, like mm -hmm. I'm gonna help you, but don't use it on. And so it was, I mean, like you say, you in, engage in this and that, and these people, I mean, they are really. I don't know. I mean, that's so confusing that um, that my intuition told me no, and and I, and, and I also read the other people. I, I read their body language, and I said, I think I have a, um, I, I made a consensus that this guy is just trying to get some free money. I mean, from the, I mean, he had very nice shoes, very nice pants. I mean, he was shaven, everything. So he didn't fit the pattern. So I mean, what what? Uh, so I don't know. It, it was my judgment, just like you said. And, or it was my intuition that was just saying, oh, don't be fooled by this guy. So, mm -hmm. how, I mean, that's so interesting that I mean, it's hard to, hard, had to, yeah. hard to tell the part. Well, often there's uncertainty. Most of the time there's uncertainty. Very few things that happen <laughs> to us happen with, you know, with certainty. We almost always don't know what the right answer is. That's kind of standard. And the way you approach that, is with intuition, and you uh, you think about it, you feel about it, and try to divorce yourself when you're feeling about it, being intuitive, with your intellect, because your intellect makes judgments. Your intellect tends to assess things based on on what it knows. But you never will have enough information for your intellect to actually tell you something with any certainty. There's not enough information there. Okay, you look at the guy, he looks like he has some money, but you know, so what's going on here? The intellect just doesn't have enough information to tell you. Your intuition will have enough information to tell you. Your, in your in intuition has access to all the information it needs to tell you. But the problem is, is that your intellect gets in the way. Your intuition may tell you something, but the intellect will jump in and say, no, it's, that's not like that. Like, this guy's just a hustler. He's just trying to grab a few coins before he you know, goes to his office selling stocks or something. <laughs> you know, he's just a real hustler. But you know, if you can separate the intellect, if you can tell that intellect to sit down, then intuitively, what do you feel? What should you do? You know, what, do you, what do you feel like? What's, what's there if your intellect is not interfering? Then do that. And don't worry about whether you were right or wrong. Because you'll never know. You're going to get off at this stop, and he's going to get off at some other stop, and you'll never see the guy again. But just do what it is that you feel is right at the time, with one exception. And that is, if your wife disagrees with you. <laughs> then do whatever it is she feels is right at the time. So those, those are the rules. <laughs> Hello. Thank you, Donna and Keith, for bringing us here. Thank you, Tom and Pam. And thank you, the little artists, for all the great drawings behind Tom. Um, <laughs> yeah. So my niece passed away when she was in my sister's, you know, belly at six months. And I suffered a lot, but I try to stay calm and be there for my sister, knowing that she suffers too. And then I came home and my son is two, he barely speaks two syllables, but he'll sit there playing from across the room and he'll say, Sabrina, 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 he's singing. So I'm like, 
why is he saying my niece's name? Like, what are you saying, honey? And she, he ignores me. He goes, Sabrina, Sabrina, Sabrina. So was that a sign from my niece to, to comfort me, knowing that I needed? And why wouldn't it be directly to me, but it was through my son? Because when I saw that, I, I smiled, and I say, what a great gift. Mm -hmm. And so I share it with my sister, thinking that, oh, what a great gift that we got this message from my niece. But she's not like me. I don't know a lot of people like me, not my family, my friends, so they don't take it the same way. And then um, a few weeks later, the suffering came again because she's going to be cremated. And I feel my blood pressure going really high, but on the exterior, my kids see me as mommy normal, but inside is a lot of suffering. And that night I had a dream and it was so, it was a blessing, again, a gift. I see her at a tree, but I don't see her face. Mm -hmm. And she's playing, and I get the message that she's happy where she is. Like, mm -hmm. it, was, it was such a gift. When I woke up, I told my sister right away, but my sister, again, doesn't take it the same. She's just like, oh. And then a few years later, my husband's grandfather died, and I've never seen him cry and he cried a lot, so that made me suffer. And um, a few weeks later, we were at dinner, and I was sharing a story with my husband and kids that I had a dream about great-grandpa. And so my son, at the time, he was eight. He goes, oh, yeah, the night when we came back from the hospice, um, great-grandpa came and told him, Shh, go to sleep. And, I, and we didn't know because he didn't tell us right there and then. He told us a couple weeks later, and I say, did grandpa tell you in English or in Vietnamese? Because they don't communicate because they don't speak the same language. And he goes, he just told me, mommy, yeah. you know? So my question is, when I see my husband suffer greatly and my sister for the, the loss, and I do suffer too, but I feel they suffer more, why do they not get the messages so that it can ease their suffering and why do other people get messages to relay these messages? And, oh my God, <laughs> lost my okay. train of thought. <laughs> okay. Yeah, the question is, why does the larger conscious system make contacts with some people and not other people? Particularly when those other people seem to be in need uh, even more. Why do they pick out messengers like yourself to deliver the message instead of, instead of giving it directly? Um, and why, in this case, did your uh, daughter get the message instead of you? My son. Did, yeah, your son get yeah. the message instead of you. That's because the system, seems it just we almost had a, a wreck here. Need to set that up. The, the system is interested in helping people deal with things like that. Because when you are when you're grieving and when you're upset, that's not a good growth period for most people because that grieving tends to be largely with the ego. You're grieving because things aren't the way you want them to be. It's not like I want. So grieving tends to be a period that is, that is full of self-pity. Oh no. And sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's just focused on others. And that's okay. But grieving's something we have to get through. You know, it's not like grieving's a bad thing. It's something we have to deal with, but we need to deal with it and go on. And the system generally tries to help people do that. And the reason that your, your son got that message rather than you was probably because you accepted it more easily that way. Had you gotten the message, you may have said, oh, did I just make that up? Was that really you know, a message for me? Or you just got maybe the name repeated like that? What does that mean? Whereas when your son gave the message, you understood it in whole, that it was a positive thing, that, you know, Sabrina was okay. 
you got that whole thing. You didn't, your intellect didn't jump in and work on it like it would have if given you, but now having gotten that message, now you were more open to the next message. So then that, that came to you because you were at a state of mind where you would be able to accept that. Maybe you were too upset the first time that you wouldn't have gotten the message. The reason that your sister doesn't get the message is because she's probably not open to it. It's probably not something that she can accept and have it comfort her. To her, it might be just another instance where she thinks of something painful. So it hurts more than it helps. So that's like why her, it, her friend, I, I have these gifts and I feel it's such a gift, the, these messages. And when I give it to her, she doesn't take it like that. It's like, oh, okay, it's just right. you, Joanne. But like if her friend painted a picture of what Sabrina would be as a toddler, she goes and she shares it with everyone. And she's so happy and she loves that painting because it's something mm -hmm. she can touch. But these direct messages, she doesn't receive yeah. it the same as I do. Right. She's not ready for that yet. And she is who she is, and let her be who she is. And you can pass those things on, but if they don't have much of an effect, then accept that that's the way she is, and that's OK. okay. You can still pass them on, or maybe. Uh, I, I do, I do. Yeah. And I, I do let her be. But okay. my question was why you know, some people get it and some people don't. Because some people are ready for it and open to it, and other people are not ready and not open. It's a space you have to grow to. And who knows what the dynamic is between you and your sister. Maybe she's less open to it just because it comes from you. That's very true. <laughs> yeah. Very just true. Just because you're the older sister? I am. <laughs> yes, because sometimes the older sister has, has been uh, someone that's been correcting and helping to raise and giving them directions and so on. And um, they're bit of a surrogate mother figure and that kind of thing. And there may be some pushback about anything that comes from you. So it may just be that. But You're, that's, that's but right. That's on point. Okay, too. Just let that be. You know, it's the way it is. Have you met my sister? Like, dead on, everything that you're saying. Yeah, that happens. Mm. Okay. And so this gentleman was saying the, your intuition and your intellect. And I have this crazy, silly phobia of lizards. I, I, I see them, and I, my gut is drop the hose and run back in the house, and I do. But my intellect would be like, you're so silly. Smile at it. It's so cute. It's not going to hurt you. So that's the intellect talking. But my gut is like, drop the hose and run. Mm -hmm. So can you help me like overcome that fear somehow? <laughs> well. Many of us have fears, and that, that lizard is probably a metaphor for something else, but in any case, that's what comes to your mind, where you see a lizard and you're frightened of it. The way to deal with that sort of a, a fear is to have courage, okay? Next time you see a lizard, don't drop what you have and run, but just back up 10 steps. You know, get, get, put a little distance between you and it, but don't run. So now you back up, you know, the lizard was here and you were there, and now you've moved back where you can still see it, but you're further away from it, and just stay there for a while and watch it. And then but as I you can't watch breathe it, when I see it, even a picture of it, like my heart races, I get sweaty palm, I can't yeah. breathe. Then we have to start further back, that fear chain. Start with a picture. Start with a cartoon of a lizard, not a real lizard. Start with just a, you know, a lizard symbol, which is mm -hmm. a cartoon lizard. And what, you know, look at that in the, on the page, in the book. Put your hand on the page, on oh, the book. Touch no. the lizard, the cartoon lizard. And if that's too hard, mm -hmm. make the cartoon even less lizard-like. Okay. So you have to start someplace. If you can back off enough that there's something that you can deal with, that has still some sense of lizard to it, start there and just very slowly work your way 
to the point where you can, your courage will and your body will let you go further and further. It's just one little step at a time. That's the way um, all phobias are dealt with. You get to a phobia, something that's just for no reason, it's totally irrational, just terrifies you. You have to back off to the point where you can stand to interact with it at some, even if it's on a page, even if it's a cartoon, you know, you back up to where you can deal with it and then very slowly work your way past that. You know, people that are afraid of lizards or spiders or snakes or something, they start with a picture in a book and then they actually have touched the picture in the book and then they get other pictures and the other pictures get more and more, um, uh, you know, snake-like say or lizard-like. And then they finally get to a point where they have a picture of a, of a snake or a lizard with its mouth open and its teeth there, you know, like ready to strike. And that's tougher to get up and touch that picture, you know, but you work your way up to that. And then you work your way to a lizard that's in a cage, safely locked away. And just, it takes courage. You say it's a metaphor for my fears that are deep down. And I've been trying to work at it to see what my fears are so that I can't, I could play with a lizard maybe one day, yeah. but it's hard. I don't know what my it fears hard, are. But don't expect to make a great leap into it to one day, you know, just stoop over and pick up the lizard and pet it. It probably won't work like that. You have Story. to very slowly work your way through it and very intentionally work your way through it. So if and I find my fears, would that fear of the lizard go away? That lizard is probably more metaphorical than real. It's, mm -hmm. That's why it doesn't make any sense to you. It's more of a metaphor for something else going on, and it may be for your fears that are inside of you. Maybe right. the the metaphor that it's that it's triggering. But okay. still, if it's a metaphor, as you develop the courage slowly to approach it and deal with it, then a lot of the fear will just dissipate. Okay, I'll let and you when know. When fear dissipates, you'll notice that all sorts of other fears will dissipate at the same time. But it's worth doing. But most people won't do it unless they make themselves do it. Mm -hmm. Because without making themselves do it, they'll just avoid it. Mm -hmm. Because avoiding it doesn't, you know, feels better. And when they deal with it, uh, the stomach knots up, you know, the, the adrenaline starts to pump. You got all these physiological things going on. So you have to force yourself to take the step and take the next step, but it's worth it because eventually you'll, you'll get over it. And um, I'm sorry, one of the greatest gifts that you can give someone is the gift of no fear. And that is what you have given me and maybe most of us. And the no fear is you don't judge us. And I wanna, uh, my heart is full of love and gratitude for you and thank you for all that you do. You're very welcome. <laughs> Okay, I'm try, try, trying to make it as simple as possible. So, uh, does a non-player character have free will? Its free will is the free will of the system that's created it. So the LCS has free will, so it creates a non-player character and it is that character's free will. It's making choices for that character. So, so it has free will in that sense. It's a, a non-player character in this reality, say, uh, is, a, is a, uh, you know, some, something with a physical body here. And it does make choices, obviously, but those choices are being made by the system rather than by an IUOC that's a very small difference. It's not, you know, an, I, uh, a, um, an NPC, but for those that don't speak uh, gaming talk, it's non-player character. That's a player, uh, that's a character in a virtual reality that's run by the computer rather than by some other player that's logged on to the game. So there's really no difference between an NPC and a player other than that the consciousness playing the NPC is the system rather than some IUOC, which is just a piece of the system. You see, it's about the same. So, 
the non-player characters have consciousness. Sure. So if a non-player character falls down in the woods and there's no individual unit of consciousness to observe it, it does it feel pain? <laughs> the system playing that NPC will no doubt get the feedback back from the NPC. So I would say yes, it probably does feel the pain in the sense that the LCS is playing a character. So he's making choices for that character and those choices have ramifications here. And one of those ramifications might be pain. So it's, it's playing a character in its own game, if you will. So it could not feel the pain if it wanted to. It's the system. It controls all the data flows. If it didn't want to absorb that, it could, but it's there. You, know, you, can, you can ignore things that you don't want. And even, you know, you and I can do that as well. Everybody can do that. And pain is one of those things that you can learn how to ignore when you have to, when you have to do other, you know, when you have to focus elsewhere, you can just let the pain go and it goes away. You don't have that anymore. So the system can do that as well. So you say, does it feel pain? Well, if it's just getting the data normally, yes, it would, but it wouldn't have to. For example, Here's an NPC example. Sometimes we read about some horrible thing that happens where parents have maybe three or four children and for some twisted reason, they torture these children. You know, they put their cigarettes out on their arms. They do things like that. They torture them. They hurt them. They uh, terrorize them. And one day they're discovered and the parents go off to jail and somebody else takes them care of the kids and it's a big news story and we kind of read that and we say oh how awful they've been torturing these kids for like 10 years and nobody knew how could that possibly go on you know how could the system let that go on why didn't that system just happen to have a policeman or a child care or somebody knock on that door one day just by accident to find that you know how could the system let that go on well, what happens there for the most part is that we're, we're children in particular, but even adults, when there's that level of abuse, the system takes that IUOC and that free will awareness unit out of the game. And they can go do something else, maybe some other incarnation or maybe just wait a while. But they take them out of the game and the system plays that child as an NPC. And the reason it does that is because it's not profitable for the system to have that IUOC be terrorized for 10 years and end up twisted and a sociopath themselves because of the horrible thing they had to go through. So rather than let that happen and just create more dysfunction and higher entropy in the system, it simply, and it doesn't see any way that it's going to resolve that if it doesn't do something about it, then it just will step in and the, the free will awareness unit that was playing it goes, does something else that's not so traumatic. And it'll play that character. And then the police come in and they arrest the parents and the children now grow up. The system may continue to play them up to a point where they are gain positivity again, in which case some other Free will awareness unit might log on and take over from there, or maybe not. It's hard to say. So what, what is the basic benefit of like the dark nature that arrives in people that, I mean, everybody's aware of it. Everybody knows their neighbor or somebody who's experienced this on a personal level. But when it also happens on a larger level, as large as you can get, it's, it's why is it constructed this way? I mean, I understand that we have to have the free will, but it just seems like the structure of it and, and what looks to me like algorithms to keep us from getting answers as to why it is that way. It's like that's outside of our realm. We're not supposed to know that. But 
you have to get back to yesterday. I'm not one of those guys that's going to go twiddle my thumbs. I mean, I've been thrown out of a second story window for because I have not stopped talking since I got to this place. This is weird to me. The whole thing is just, it's very odd. Yeah. And it's set up to facilitate really nasty stuff. And I find it offensive. I find if you were to stand up and say, Frank, I've heard enough of this. Take the blue pill or take the red pill. I know the red pill's right. I'd take the blue pill and I would start an avatar rebellion. <laughs> it seems okay. abusive. Yeah. I, you know, what are these humans? Okay, it is are not, they, the system is not set up to facilitate you know, high entropy stuff. It's not, it doesn't exist to facilitate that. That just exists. And yes, the answer is because of free will. People have free will. The system doesn't want to interfere. We're here interacting with each other and we're going to make of it what we make of it. And what we make of it, you know, you have to, you know, you know, whatever it is, we have to live with it. That's our feedback for how we are. So the system isn't, isn't a god playing with these pet people. Oh, these people aren't being nice, let me reach in and fix that. And these people are being good, so let me drop a gold brick at their doorstep. It doesn't work like that. We're here. We make choices. We have free will, and we can make of it what we want. We can turn this into a, you know, a terrible place if we wish, and the system will just let it run down the drain and let it go because that's our choices. And our feedback is nobody likes it here. So what are you going to do about it? Well, we need to change it. We need to grow up. We need to be nicer. That's the lesson. It has to, you know, we have to get the results, the consequences of our choices. It's not a good learning lab if the system is always stepping in and rearranging things. We can't learn anything that way. So the system has free will. We are able to de-evolve as well as evolve, and then we get the, you know, we get to swim in that soup. We make that bed, we have to lie in it, you know, whatever metaphor you want. We have to experience who we are. And as that experience says, wow, we're really messed up, we need to change, that provides the incentive for us to change. That's what pushes people to look around and say, you know, this isn't working. What can we do? And that makes a ripe environment for revolution. When enough people say, this isn't working, what can we do? That starts to feed the process of change. That's how the whole thing works, but we have to do it ourselves. It's not a system set up to fail or a system set up to encourage evil. It's just the system that lets us be who we are. And we get the consequences of that, and then we have to deal with it. And if we deal with it with anger, and we deal with it with ego, it makes us angry, and we rage against it, then we become part of the problem. Because the problem is rage, the problem is anger, the problem is fear. So if we run around and saying, you know, it's, this, is a, this is a terrible place. They're doing this to us, they're doing that to us, they're poisoning us, they're doing this, they're stealing our children, you know. It's awful, it's terrible. What we're doing is sowing fear. We're making other people feel more frightened, less capable. We want, we're, we're making them want to make decisions to go you know, inside their houses and lock all the doors and stay there rather than go out and interact. And that's not helpful. So the point is, when things get really dysfunctional, that has to be the, that has to be the consequence that makes us turn it around to be more functional. And the most effective thing you can do is turn yourself around. Let go of the anger. Let go of the fear. Let go of the angst. Because that just feeds the problem. Angry people feel the problem. You do need to educate. You do need to explain. You do need to show, spend, you know, shine a big spotlight on that dysfunction. You need to talk to people and share. That, you do that, but you have to do it in a positive way. If you do it in a, in a, um, in a negative way, shine that spotlight, spotlight on them and say, oh yeah, look, those are the people the problem. Let's get them. You know, that's just feeding the problem. 
It just turns the problem from one thing to a different thing, but it's still the problem. You have to not feed it. So it, it just is what it is. It's negative because we're negative. We, humanity, we're negative. We've got a lot to learn. But we won't learn it unless there are people offering alternatives and other people willing to you know, reach out for that alternative. And nobody does that if they're all cowering in a corner someplace with fear. You have to accept it. This is the way it is. Now, what am I going to do about it? Well, first, grow up yourself. And then help other people grow up. And the more people they are that look around and say, this is unacceptable. We need to not accept this. We need a rebellion. You know? We need to change this thing. Then's when it will start to change. But if just another violent rebellion, it'll end up right back where it was because nobody's grown up. Everybody's just pushing their ego. So it has to be a rebellion that leaves the whole system better off rather than just changed. Yeah, that's what we have to do. That's our job, that's our mission here, is to improve this place, lower the entropy, more love, less fear, less hate, less greed, less meanness, you know? That's what we're here for, is to create that. And there's hundreds of ways to do that, but they have to be done in a positive way, not in a way that just makes it worse. If it's us against them, if that's the way it's framed, that won't help a lot. It's got to be us understanding them and helping them grow up. And we can't do that until we're grown up. Because until we're grown up, we don't have any interest in helping anybody grow up. We just want to beat them, change them, force them to do it our way, which of course is a better way. They feel the same way. They want to force you to do it their way because in their mind, that's a better way. And it just goes on and on with struggle. All right. Huh. Hi, Tom. Uh, again, uh, my question actually fell to number three because there's some very powerful questions here. So very quickly, I wanted to comment on, uh, there's been a couple individuals and a couple from Oklahoma, I think, that discussed death. I think uh, this young lady back there was talking about the death of Bernice. Uh, there is a, um, a very, very powerful YouTube video between Gary Zukov, Oprah Winfrey, and a, ch a couple that lost a, one of the twins. And the, the only thing I can say, it, it is so powerful that you don't even need language. If you feel the vibrations and you, the, the TV cameras and you watch these people, an audience of 2,000 people were in tears and felt the presence of that child. I did. And I was only looking in the kitchen, looking at, at, at the video. Uh, so I, it's Gary Zukov and Oprah Winfrey. Uh, you, you would have to search it. You know, uh, it's only... Uh, the, the dialogue is probably two to three minutes long, but it was so powerful, to, to, at least to me, to help me understand that there's, I mean, it's no question, there's another, there's something else out there. All this, you know, LCS we talk about in different dimensions and all that, it is so true. And these children are okay, but it's something that, anyway, I, I think everyone should at least look at that. We're not talking about a long video. Uh, it's the exchange, it's the energy. The other, there was another individual here for, that was talking about what we bring in the next car, incarnation, uh, knowledge and everything, and Tom, you commented on that. There is, I wanted to point out that Ian Stevenson, Dr. Stevenson from the University of Virginia Medical School has done countless studies with children about what they know, what they remember, and whatever. So if anyone's interested in that, it's Ian Stevenson, I-A-N. Stevenson, he has passed away, but his research goes on and on, and it's very, it's great, if you're into that. Now, very quickly, my question is, we're talking about multiplayer games, 
uh, virtual realities, different realities. One night, I was in a theta state, Tom, somnambulistic level. I started talking to my daughter, and I have three children. She, she of course, is a, they're all favorites. I would not have picked her to be my partner, soul partner, whatever, but I can tell you I merged with her soul. So I thought it was so strange I didn't even mention it to anybody for two or three months. And then I, I came upon Michael Newton, which I believe you're familiar with, started reading his book, Journey of the Souls, chapter 10. He starts talking about at least some of his people that were under hypnosis a lot of people are involved in multiple incarnations. So that's what I was going to ask you about that. You know, the audience here can say, well, yeah, I was in a dream state. Well, you know what? I know what I am and I'm not. If I'm in Delta or Theta, I've been doing this. But I was in a Theta state and bam, I was at one with her. So my question is, have you come across people that are, uh, I mean, she's not in my, in this avatar. She's got her own avatar, but we're absolutely Without a question, it's, it's a multiple incarnation, I think, that Michael Newton's talking about. So I, I just was going to ask you about that. You know, I knew, and I wasn't asleep. I was not in Delta. And I, you know, um, I wasn't in REM. I, kn I knew what was going on. Yeah, the, uh, having one IOC have multiple uh, incarnations at the same time, sure, that happens. It's, it happens more in the margins than in the mainstream because learning is a cumulative process. But there are some things that, that having several incarnations from the same IUOC interacting with each other produces a very effective learning experience. And it happens. It's common. I know of one case where there were three individuals who all interacted with each other and they were all from the same IUOC. They were all connected. Often that happens where you have a person has a need to really connect at a very fundamental and deep level with another. Uh, sometimes I've seen it where you have a a person who had a very, say, troublesome relationship say, uh, uh, with his father. And it was, a, it was a really bad relationship. And the next time that he has an incarnation, he incarnates too, where he is the father and the son, both. And that way, he gets to see both ends, both, both sides. He gets to see the the constraints that the parent has in raising the child, and he gets to see the son's viewpoint. So the father is also the son, and the son is also the father. And that way, it gave him an opportunity to pass through this real troublesome problem that he had had, which was causing him a lot of difficulty. So things like that will happen. And sometimes it doesn't have to be an issue like that. It may be that it's it's a good thing just to have that kind of a close knowing with somebody else. Just to share that, just that opportunity to be that close in consciousness with someone else. And yeah, it happens. How did you validate the story that you just said, the father and son? Um, well, you can validate it by going back into the consciousness and into the databases and asking questions and finding out what, you know, where they came from, you know, the IC, IUSCs, the history, uh, so on, and basically you start at two points and you end up going back to the same point. Okay. And you say, oh, okay, came from one, you know, one source for both. So that's how. I did that. Very good. But it's not that, you know, it's not like it happens 80% of the time, but, you know, 10%, 5%. People do that every once in a while. Not every incarnation, but occasionally, just as it, as it occurs. Um, 
it's generally a very profound experience where those two people know each other so intimately that uh, it's almost like they're just one person, you know, sharing two bodies. They're not really because both have gone through their own environmental stuff, their own experiences, making their own choices. So they're two individuals, but they have a root at the center that is common to a degree that's profound. 